of you guys remember these right here? You used to put these in your car, and uh, I know it's really old school, okay? I'm showing my age. This right here is actually uh, just north Orange County right here. So if you were going to go someplace and you didn't know exactly how to get there, you'd pull this thing out. And, 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 you know, they talk about not using your cell phone while you're driving, about how dangerous that is. <laughs> Remember the days you put this thing on your steering wheel, drive around, try to figure out where you're going to go. You know, uh, and then how do you fold these things up, by the way, too? We need like, uh, here, I'm just, I'm done with that, okay? Like. It's kind of the process. And then I remember before I came out here, my wife and I, we moved here 11 years ago from Missouri. And uh, I got a gift before I came out here. I felt it was going to be the most important thing that I needed when I came to California. And I bought a Tom Tom. You guys remember the Tom Tom? And it's got the little suction. You put it on your windshield right there. And, you know, you kind of type in where you're going to go. And now since then, we've upgraded. Now you have Waze. How many of you use the, the app Waze? Shows you, okay, where all the traffic's going to be. Or maybe use Google Maps. Or how many of you use Siri? Okay, I, I like to use Siri. And you just tell Siri, here's where I want to go. And Siri throws up where you want to go. But I, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with Siri. Because sometimes I don't think Siri knows what, what Siri's doing. And all of a sudden, it says those dreaded words of recalculating. And, and, you know, sometimes I look at where Siri's taking me, and I'm like, that's not the right way. Or that's the slow way. Come on, Siri, there's a faster way. How come you don't know? You don't have to go all the way around there. Have any of you ever tried the maps, the Google Maps or Siri, and you tried to go your own way and found out that your way wasn't the best way? All of a sudden, you ran into traffic, ran into things you weren't expecting or anticipating. You know, the question is this. Are you going to listen to the directional authority in your life? Or are you going to try to do it your own way? Are you going to read the map and follow what the map says? Or are you going to try to do it your own way? And I believe that this is so true when it comes to our spiritual life and when it comes to this highway that we call life as well. It's who or what is going to become the authority of our life. And then comes the question as we're trying to get from point A to point B, will we listen to the authority? Or will we simply say, no, I know a better way. Or no, I don't think so. I, I, I think that this would be a... And how many times are we going to recalculate in life? And I want to make a case today. And the case that I want to make today is I believe that the Bible should be the number one authority in our life. I believe that if you want a life that is filled with peace and significance and joy and an adventure, that you will follow the roadmap called the Bible. This is God's word. And God's word shows us how to go God's way instead of the world's way. But you're going to have to make a choice if you're actually going to look at the map or not. So what I want to do today is I want to talk to you and I want to kind of build a case on why I believe you should use the Bible as your map for life. Now, if you decide to go this route and you decide to use the Bible as your roadmap for life, you're going to be criticized. I don't know if you read or not, but this past week, GQ Magazine came out with an article, and they had the 21 books that they say are famous books that are really useless for your life. 21 books that you don't need to read that they called foolish and unnecessary. And on their list of 21 books that is foolish and unnecessary is the Bible. And here's what was published this past week in GQ Magazine. Jesse Ball, he said, the Holy Bible is rated very highly by all the people who supposedly live by it, but who in actuality have not read it. While conceding it has some good parts, he maintains that overall it's certainly not the finest thing that man has ever produced. He says it's repetitive, self-contradictory, sententious, foolish, and even at times ill intentioned. This past week, we, one of our staff members actually put it on our group text, and all it said was GQ, the Bible, the Bible's foolish 
and unnecessary. The title was Foolish and Unnecessary. And Eddie replied back and, and Eddie said, oh, I thought you were talking about GQ magazine. <laughs> you know, there's three dimensions of salvation that I want to talk to you about today. And I'm going to give you some theological terms, but I want to make sure that I explain these theological terms as well. Three dimensions of salvation. The first dimension is justification. The second is sanctification. The third is glorification. Now let me explain these words. The first is justification. And if you want an easy way to remember what justification means, it simply means just as if I never sinned. Justification. Just as if I never sinned. So when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, when you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and take full control of your life, then you can experience what the Bible calls justification. It means that Jesus came on a rescue mission to pay for your sins. And he went to the cross and he died. And three days later, he rose again so that if we put our faith and trust and acknowledge our sin and acknowledge him that he is the only way, then we can experience justification, which is the salvation for the punishment for our sins. It's just as if we've never sinned in our relationship with God. That's some good news, is it not? That when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. What he sees is he sees our Savior who covered our sin with the blood of Jesus Christ. That's called sanctification. Now, some people, many believers, many Christians, and many people, they believe justification is the entire portion of following Jesus Christ. And what they will do is they will claim their justification, but they just stop right there. And I would say that justification is the starting point, not the ending point. And for some people, they're like, okay, just as if I never sinned, I prayed, I asked Jesus into my heart. Now, I don't care anymore about the Jesus thing. Jesus, see you later. See you at the end of my life. And that's over. And it's done. And I would say that justification is just a start because then you move into the next dimension of salvation, which is sanctification. And sanctification, it means to be set apart. This is whenever you are set apart as holy to be more like Jesus. Sanctification is the lifelong process of becoming like Jesus. It's the work that God begins to do in our life to work on our character, to work on our values, to work on our beliefs, to work on our behaviors. And if justification, if it's salvation from the punishment of sin sanctification, it is salvation from the power of sin in our current lives right now. Because if you want to stop the natural flow of sin in your life, that only happens through the sanctification process. That only happens as you begin to develop spiritual habits in your life. That's what this series has all been about. This Word 511 is a series of sanctification. We've been challenging you over the last few weeks to do the Word 511 challenge. That's whenever you're going to read God's Word. You're going to shoot for seven days a week, but if you hit five, call to success. And I challenge you to read at least a chapter a day. We've challenged you to get on version, the Bible app, and find a Bible reading plan. So just you and God at least five days a week. And then one day a week, you're going to talk to your spouse. And you're simply going to say, man, what's God teaching you? And if you're not married, you're going to find a friend. You're going to find somebody in your growth group. You're going to find a roommate. You're going to find somebody maybe in your family and say, hey, let's, let's talk about the one time a week. What's God teaching you? And then the third one is a time whenever you're going to talk to your children. And he said, let's have a spiritual conversation about what God is teaching you. And last night I did that with my family. And at dinner time we went around and everybody told us about what God's teaching them through their time with God. And some of you say, I don't have any kids. So what does that mean for me? Find somebody younger than you. See, we're a church that thinks three, three generations. See, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we're not just thinking about one generation, we're thinking about the next generation, and we're not stopping there, we're thinking about the next generation after that. 
And that's part of the 511. So if you're, you don't have kids, say, okay, hey, who's somebody younger? Who's somebody else I can mentor? Who's somebody else that I can learn and then I can return? This is a sanctification series. And then we move on to the third dimension of salvation, which is glorification. And glorification isn't going to happen until Jesus comes back. But one of these days, Jesus is coming back, and the Bible promises that there's going to be a glorification process. That means there's going to be a new heaven. That means there's going to be a new earth. That means that we're going to be in a state of glorification, and we will be free from the four Ds of our life, the big four Ds. Divorce, disease, difficulties, depression. We will be free from death. That's five Ds, okay? I can keep going. I'm, I'm a pastor, okay? I, I get 10 Ds if I need to. Listen, we can be free from these things. But that promise isn't going to happen until Jesus comes back. But that is hope that we can put our hope in. That one of these days there's going to be a glorification of no pain, no sickness, no cancer. Listen, last service I'm praying with all kinds of people with health challenges, relational challenges. And I'm here to tell you that one of these days there's going to be a glorification process, church. And that we're going to be free from these things through the power of Jesus Christ. So there's more than just justification. There's also sanctification, and then there's glorification. Now, I want to make a case to you on why I believe the Bible should be the authority for our life today. And, and you say, well, can you prove that the Bible should be our authority? Listen, I'm going to tell you, no, I can't prove it 100% with all scientific evidence. I'm going to do my best I can today. But I will tell you this. Everybody puts their faith and their trust in something Every time you board an airplane, you're putting your faith and trust in something. You're putting your faith and trust in something you don't totally understand. Every time you take a pill and you swallow it, you're putting your faith and trust in something you don't understand. And so I want to challenge you today to think of as much, and, and I want you to be as, as critical with what you put your faith and trust in as you are asking those that are followers of Jesus to be as critical with them of them putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and in his holy word. So you say, Brian, why do you put your faith and trust in the Bible? And here's one reason, because of evidence. James chapter 1 and verse 21, it says, So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. That's sanctification. And humbly accept the word of God, the word God has planted in your hearts. Because here's what the word of God, it has the power to save your souls. The word of God, it's living and it is powerful. It affects our beliefs and it also, it affects our behaviors. So I want to give you some evidence today of why I believe this should be the map for your life. The first one is external evidence. It's external evidence. Do you know what the best-selling book of all time is? It's the Bible. Now, it's been on the best-selling li list for so long, they've taken it off. So if you were to Google and look up what is the number one selling book of all time, you're going to see A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. And you know how many copies it's sold? 200 million copies. Number five on the list, sold 107 million copies as Harry Potter. Any Harry Potter fans here? Now, now, just so you know, 200 copies is number one. Number five, Harry Potter in the English language, 107 million copies. The Bible has sold five billion copies. Five billion copies. And not only has it sold five billion copies, every year, a hundred million copies of the Bible is printed, distributed, and sold year in and year out. And say, well, okay, that's a, that's a lot of copies. The Bible's done pretty good for itself. Let me give you some external evidence of why I believe the Bible should be what you put your faith and trust in. Do you know that the Bible's been written over a 1,500-year time span? 40 different authors, 40 generations. 
three different languages written in Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic. It was written over three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. And the authors came from all walks of life. Some of the authors in here were shepherds, over 40 different authors. Some of them were doctors. Another one was, was a lawyer. You have all kinds of different experiences. You know, some of them were fishermen, all writing about hundreds of controversial subjects like money, marriage, adultery, parenting. And yet all 40 authors over a 1,500-year time span, and there's no contradictions amongst themselves on these major topics. And they all tell one unfolding story, the story of the redemption of man. Now let me ask you a question. Let's just go to your profession for a moment. Think about what you do. Some of you may be a businessman, maybe a businesswoman. Some of you today may be a plumber, maybe you're a cook, maybe you're a salesman, maybe you're a mom. If you were to take 40 different people from your field and have them write a book about whatever it is that you're into, how many different opinions do you think you would have? 40, right? It's miraculous that the Bible, written over a 1,500-year time span, 40 different authors, and yet has the consistency to be able to talk about the redemption of man together without contradiction. Let me give you another external evidence. Archaeology. Uh, I, I read this this past week from this famous archaeologist, uh, Nelson Gluck. It says, as a matter of fact, however, it may be clearly stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever con contradicted a single biblical reference. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or exact detail historical statements in the Bible. Did you know back in the 1970s, uh, there was all kinds of people that came out that said Sodom and Gomorrah is just a myth. There's no such cities as Sodom and Gomorrah. And then not too long after that, they actually found, this is unbelievable, I love reading this, 15,000 stone tablets with references back to Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me give you some more external evidence. What about prophecies being fulfilled? You know, there are all kinds of prophecies that were fulfilled that a prophet said this is going to happen, and it happened. One of those prophecies was that Israel would go back to their same area, their same region, their same territory. And sure enough, in 1948, you know what happened? Israel went back to their own country. That was a promise made, a promise fulfilled. That is the fulfillment of prophecy. Did you know that Jesus had 48 prophecies alone? It was pro pro uh, prophesied that Jesus would die and that, that he would rise again. He predicted his own death and his own resurrection, that it would happen in three days. 48 prophecies. There's this book by this guy named Peter Stoner. Not, not Stoner, like, like not, not that kind of Stoner. And Peter Stoner, he, he wrote this book called Science Speaks. And in his book, he said, if you were to take eight prophecies fulfilled, remind you, Jesus had 48 prophecies fulfilled. But he said, if, if you just had eight prophecies, eight things you said that were going to happen and they actually happened, the mathematical probability would be 10 to the 17th power. That's 10 with 17 zeros behind it as the mathematical probability. And Peter Stoner went on, and he said, just so you can comprehend that in your own mind, he said, if you were to take a silver dollar, and not just one, but you were to go to the entire state of Texas and fill up the entire state with silver dollars two feet deep, and you were to travel, and you went through Austin, then you went to Lubbock, and then you went to Dallas, and then you went to Houston, and you were just to randomly grab just one silver dollar. And you were to take a Sharpie marker and put an X on it, and then you just 
throw it back into the state of Texas. And then this giant blender comes out. Okay, it blends and mixes all of them up again. And then you could drive anywhere you wanted in the entire state of Texas. And you got one choice to pick one silver dollar. The mathematical probability of you finding that one silver dollar with the X on it would be 10 to the 17th power. Jesus did not fulfill eight prophecies. Jesus fulfilled 48 prophecies. The mathematical probability would be 10 to the 157th power of that happening. Listen, I believe prophecies are important when you're looking at external evidence of the Bible. You know, there was a lot of propaganda through the Da Vinci Code a few years ago. And the Da Vinci Code specifically said that, that men tampered with the Bible. That the words of scripture that we have today, that they're not true. And that people, they wrote different words in because they had an agenda or something they were trying to push by religion. And, and there's, there's actually a professor that wrote a book, uh, and I love the title of his book. It says, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And in his book, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. He talked about the Jewish, how, how respectful Jewish people were and the Jews were to the manuscripts. And that as they were copying the manuscripts, if there was one error, if any of the Bible was, was frayed or if there was any damage, they would burn it. And they would burn it respectfully like we do with like an American flag that, that, that's, you know, been damaged. Just one little point. Now, at one time, the closest that we had to one of the originals of the Old Testament was written 1,200 years. It was 1,200 years removed from when it was written. But then in February 1947, there was this little boy named Muhammad who was out in the cliff on the west side of the Dead Sea. He was eight miles away from Jericho. And he took a rock and he threw it into this hole. And all of a sudden, he heard broken pottery. And sure enough, what they found was they found the Dead Sea Scrolls that were in these, these pottery, in these jars that had been sealed since the first century. And whenever they opened them, they realized that Scripture had been preserved for 1,900 years thus proving the accuracy of the Bible. That no matter what the Da Vinci Code says, no matter what anybody says about tampering, if you look at the facts, it's just not true. There's external evidence. The second thing we see is relational evidence. Paul was talking to his prodigy, Timothy, and here, here's what he said. He said in 2 Timothy 3.14, he says, Timothy, you must remain faithful to the things you've been taught. Because you know that they're true. For you know you can trust those who taught you. He says, I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Louise and your mother Eunice. And I know the same faith continues strong in you. Here's the thing. Timothy, he saw some relational evidence in his life. He saw something in his mother. He saw something in his grandmother that said, I want what you have. Have you ever... Uh, have you ever went and watched a movie because someone told you to go watch that movie? It's like when someone told you, Kurt did that for me, all right? Kurt, Kurt was the one who told me. He said, hey, you need to go see this movie. I can only imagine. And sure enough, I went, and I'm glad I did, Kurt, all right? It was great, and it gave me a great sermon illustration for Easter Sunday as well. It was perfect. Sorry for the spoiler alert. I got more emails about, hey, next time you're going to tell a whole movie, all right? Spoiler alert. So I'm going to close my ears. You know, when people tell you about it, I'm going to give you another movie at the end of, the, at the end of this message. I'm like, you need, to, you need to watch this movie. It's a great movie. Have you ever went to a restaurant because somebody said, you got to go to this restaurant. I mean, the service, the food is fantastic. And somebody tells you about it. How many of you became a follower of Jesus because you saw fruit in somebody's life? And you trusted their life. And they invited you to come to church. They invited you into a relationship with Jesus. Maybe as a mom, dad, maybe as a neighbor, maybe as a friend. How many of you are here today because somebody shared Jesus with you and invited you to church? Just raise your hand really high. And you saw relational evidence in your life. For me, I had a youth pastor, Tim Lindsay. Man, he, he was just, 
He was the man. I was like, I want to be like him. And I had a calling on my life, but I saw fruit in his life. And I said, man, I want to do what you do. That's how I got into ministry. And then when I was in Bible college, remember this professor named Jim Stady. Man, he just knew the word of God. He studied it. He memorized it. And it just came out. It oozed out of his life. And I was like, man, I want what you have. And I was blessed to have a mom and a dad that loved Jesus. That, that I always said I had a drug problem growing up. I was drugged to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. And they drugged me to church. But guess what? They were an example for me as well. There's relational evidence as well. And then finally, there's personal evidence. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. It says, so we've not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. And we ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will. See, some of you, you've been in the word of God and God has given you knowledge about his will for your life. And to give you spiritual wisdom. And to give you understanding. I can't tell you how many times I've been struggling with something. How many times I needed peace and I went to the word of God and the word of God gave me peace. How many times I needed strength. I was talking to this lady this last week, and she was sharing with me some, some serious challenges she's going through in her life. And she said, but Pastor Brian, she said, here's how I got through. I just kept saying, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You know, the word of God, it gives us personal evidence for our life as well. And some of you, you've disregarded the Bible. And the words of Dr. Phil, I'd ask you, How's that working for you? Because some of you have disregarded God's word when it comes to forgiveness and you're experiencing some bitterness in your life. Some of you have disregarded what the map says when it comes to finances and you're steeped in debt. It's causing relational challenges. Some of you have disregarded what God's word says about love and faithfulness and you've got some broken relationships because of it. Some of you disregarded his word when it comes to just destructive habits in your life. And this pain that you're going through, listen to me closely. It's not God punishing you. God's not mad at you. He loves you. And he's giving you his map because he wants you to come home. He wants you to be able to find the way home. There was this man who uh, was in Chicago and this man was very educated. Uh, he had a law degree from, from Yale University. And, and this man, he, uh, he was smart. He had a great job. Uh, and all of a sudden, they moved to this new area. And his wife, uh, Leslie, she actually met the neighbor whose name was Linda. And Linda began to talk to Leslie about Jesus. And she began to tell Leslie about church. And so sure enough, Leslie, she went to church. Now, her, this man, okay, he was an atheist. He was completely against church, the Bible, things of God. He said it's just filled with myths and fables and it's fairy tales. You can't trust the Bible. But his wife, as she began to get around, Linda, Leslie said, hey, I'd like to go to your church. And so sure enough, they went to this church in Chicago and through the worship music, Leslie, she just felt God. And through the love of the people. And she began to hear the pastor preach and week in and week out until finally one Sunday. Leslie, she put her faith and trust in Jesus and asked Jesus to forgive her of her sins and take full control of her life. So she went home and she told her atheist husband. And he was ticked. He was angry. The first thought that went through his mind was divorce. He said, I don't want to be married to a holy roller. He said, I, I didn't plan for this. This is what I want for my life. This man was a man that was a narcissist. All he cared about was himself. This was a man that each night he would just kind of drink himself to sleep at night. That's how he forgot about his pain. Profanity laced every word that he said. And finally, one Sunday, he decided he was going to go to church with his wife. And the pastor was speaking about basic Christianity. And this man, he left there that day making a decision, not to follow Jesus, but to make a decision that he was going to disprove Jesus. And he was going to make a case that there is 
no resurrection, that there is no Jesus. Now, this man was very educated, as I mentioned, but he also, he was an investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune. And he began to think, I bet I'm not the only man going through this. I bet there's all kinds of other women in church that are going home telling their husband that they need to go to church and they need to accept Jesus. So I'm going to help all the other men in the greater Chicago area. And I'm going to use my writing abilities and my investigative abilities. And I'm going to put it in the Herald as well. And so this man went on nearly a two-year journey investigating to find out that there was no Jesus. But here's what he said. He watched his wife, and he watched her character and her demeanor. And he came back and he said, I became personally convinced that based on the historical evidence of the resurrection, that this is actually true. And Lee Strobel, he put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ in that church on November 8th, 1981. And then he wrote a book called The Case for Christ with all of his findings. And then he wrote another book called The Case for Faith. And then another one, The Case for the Resurrection. And then another one, The Case for the Creator. And then seven years after he put his faith and trust in Christ, he took a 60% pay cut and he went on staff at the church. And he began to preach the message of the Word of God and become an apologist on why you can put your faith and trust in Christ. But here's what he said. He said, it wasn't just the evidence that I researched historically. It wasn't just the external evidence. It was the relational evidence as well. Because as I watched my wife's character change, and I watched her values changed, and I watched how she treated me, even when I was verbally abusing her, and I watched her demeanor, he said, it was something that I wanted and something that I longed for and something that I knew that I needed. Church, there's external evidence. There's relational evidence. But I hope that you'll experience what Lee Strobel experienced, personal evidence. Personal evidence about how the Word of God can change your life.